Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to start just because I, I want you guys to get the most maximum amount of time actually uh, getting to learn and work with an incredible friend and colleague, uh, Glenn Gear. And so we're really happy to have him be one of our artists in residence. And this is our first uh, workshop for Abidjibu One. And so, uh, you know, we're also excited. It's a new format and medium and everybody's figuring out how it works and uh, <laughs> we'll see it's a bit of an experiment. So bear with us today because uh, it's all new on everybody's uh, radars and then how to actually work within the framework. Uh, Glenn is a filmmaker, animator, and a visual artist of mixed Inuit ancestry from Nunatsavut, uh, Hopedale, Labrador, now based in Montreal. Much of Glenn's work explores alternative forms of storytelling through research creation, or sorry, research-based creation, in addition to personal, tactile, and sensorial knowledge rooted in his Inuit heritage. Primarily focused on animation and moving images, he also uses archives, photographs, drawings, traditional craft, and objects in his practice. He's passionate about low budget and experimental animation techniques and shares these through mentoring opportunities that have become an integral part of his practice. And that's one of the big reasons we have Glenn here today. Um, he, his work also delves, delves into the relationship between people, animals, and the land, rethinking the spaces in which history, hope, and Inuit knowledge may thrive. For those, for, for many of you, we, I am situated in the Treaty 1 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And um, right now we are just celebrating Glenn's work in uh, the, I'd say, groundbreaking exhibition in Iwa in the new building, Hamayuk. And so um, if you get the opportunity and you are in Winnipeg, definitely go see his work. Uh, it's incredible. I know it's a lot of people's favorite. And if you aren't, then listen to the little clip. We'll put it on the website of Glenn doing a beautiful articulation of his work on CBC. So without further ado, I don't want to take up any space here. I really want Glenn to shine. So um, welcome, Glenn. Uh, thank you so much, Julie. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm kind of surrounded by the tripod equipment and stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm sort of behind the scenes, as it were. But, uh, but anyway, I, I thought I would uh, start and begin by maybe talking a bit about my work and, um, and what I do uh, with focus on uh, animation. Uh, I know a number of you have had a chance maybe to, to download the uh, Black Bear Paper Puppet um, that you can cut out and um, put together. So I'll go through that uh, a little bit later. Um, but first I'll, uh, I'll go through some of uh, some of my previous stuff just to kind of provide a context for, for what I do and how I go about doing it. So let's see, can I share my screen? Do, 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 do. All right, F5. Can everyone see that? Yeah. All right. So yeah, this is uh, this is me, Glenn Gear. Um, uh, this is a shot from Alakope, which is my um, my dad's home. I consider it my ancestral home. Uh, a lot of what I do um, really involves uh, going through uh, photo archives and sort of teasing out interesting photographs that speak to. Uh, sort of the history of the Inuit from Nunatsiavut. Um, and I like to play around with those images, kind of uh, cut up those archival photographs uh, as a way of kind of inserting myself into that narrative and then creating new stories from that. <clears throat> I'm always really aware of, um, of who's taking the photograph and how people are framed, uh, often within a colonial context. I like to break that apart and play around with it and make up uh, new stories or narratives. This is, uh, the Nain brass band. Um, the Moravian missionaries uh, brought over a lot of brass instruments very early on because they wanted to teach the Inuit how to play instruments and to make uh, kind of Western music. Um, the brass band and brass instruments were then adopted after many generations. Um, and the uh, Nain brass band in Labrador is still pretty active today. And this is within the Moravian, Moravian church. 
I like to play around with my own photographs from a contemporary space with these archival photographs and kind of mix them up. Uh, some of them uh, become static collages, but I also, um, I also film that whole process of constructing these collages under camera. So uh, I'll show you a clip a little bit later of uh, a piece from Halonat. Um, and uh, you'll see how, how this particular image uh, came about. I love, uh, I love dogs and huskies, of course, all animals. And a lot of my stories are about animals and humans and land and the uh, interrelations therein. Um, I, I've worked on a number of uh, larger scale uh, productions with the NFB. Uh, one of them, this is from, uh, I think, uh, 2017, called Beyond Ice. And it was uh, a series of small animated vignettes of the Arctic, but getting away from this idea of, uh, you know, the Arctic as a, a vast kind of white wasteland with, with igloos occasionally dotting the landscape. So we were thinking about the idea of ice and um, a kind of cosmology or stars. And um, these images were projected onto real sheets of re real pieces of ice. It's a complex sort of reverse refrigerator system where ice is built up through frost in the air to create these huge slabs. So this is a permanent piece in, <clears throat> excuse me, the. Um, Museum of, of, of Nature in Ottawa at the uh, Canada Goose Arctic Gallery. Um, so it was a combination of live action and I was in charge of the animated sequences in between those live action, uh, those live action sequences um, and projected onto these two uh, main pieces of, of ice. And kids love to get caught in the middle of this. It's really fun for security. Um, I love this piece. It's really fun. You can see handprints on the, the right hand side. Uh, kids often will go up and press their hands in and continually uh, melt, the, melt the ice. Um, this, was, uh, uh, this was in Banff, I think in 20, uh, when was that, 2018? And, yeah, um, 2018. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Julie. I have no concept of time. <laughs> and so it's even worse now. <laughs> this was a, a series of, um, I was working on this idea of this ghost dog and thinking about uh, the history of, um, of the dog call that, that happened across Canada and a lot of uh, Inuit communities and how the, the dogs are killed outright. So these spirit dogs uh, kind of came to me in uh, a kind of uh, animated form. And I, I, I did what's known as a run cycle. Often in animation, you do a walk cycle or a run cycle and that can be looped. So I have this, uh, this running dog kind of wolf shadow figure that was, uh, I, I did the drawings out of, um, uh, campfire charcoal. So it's really soft. It was a campfire that we had at the residency, I think on the first night kind of gathering. And I, uh, I asked if I could, if I could take some of the charcoal and, and I made the, the, these drawings out of that. Those drawings became the basis for further drawings and investigation that became animated. And I have, um, have these uh, running dogs, which I think of as kind of these spirit dogs, but as part of a, a dog team. So this is uh, Kimutsik, or this became the prototype for subsequent pieces that, that were known as uh, Kimutsik or um, sled dogs. Um, and this was part of Memory Keepers, which was in 2019 um, as part of a short residency uh, at Concordia University with Guam Collective. And uh, this is a group show that we did for Nuit Blanche, uh, which is Montreal All Nighter. And it was really fun to have, uh, to have this, this big charcoal dog kind of running on the side of a building in context with other contemporary Inuit artists um, who are doing uh, other animation and installation and sound-based projects. Um, this is uh, more animals. You'll probably notice this bear. This bear comes up a lot. 
Um, and uh, this was a, a piece that I, I did uh, last year called um, Karangak, which means together, like. Um, and uh, it's set to traditional Inuit throat singing. And I'll show you a clip uh, later on. There all these uh, animals from Nunatsiavut that are kind of singing back and forth to one another, rocking back and forth in kind of rhythmic action. So taking this archival um, audio and kind of reinterpreting it in a, in a very contemporary uh, sort of way and a, a way that's, that's really light. Plus I, I, lots of sort of luscious colors and uh, beadwork which is um, something I'd like to be doing more of right now. And I, I probably will get back to be work. And uh, finally, this is uh, the piece that's, um, um, that's an, oh my God, I'm forgetting all my Inuit words today. <laughs> Hamayok. Um, it's in the show, Kamayok or Hamayok. Um, uh, the show Inua uh, and the building is, is uh, Kamayuk. Uh, this piece is uh, called uh, Iluani uh, Silami. It's full of stars. So Iluani Silami means inside outside, and it's full of stars as a reference to Stanley Kubrick's um, um, uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey. Uh, so I was really thinking about. Uh, this installation, it took place in a, situated in a shipping container, which were pretty ubiquitous up north. Um, and a lot of people end up uh, getting goods that are shipped up in these containers. And then uh, the community keeps the containers as sort of like sheds that people can, can use. Um, and I decided to, uh, to install this large mural inside. Um, uh, that kind of wraps around. Uh, there are two sides, one set in the past, one set in the future, and they meet in the middle with this giant eye or oculus into which is projected um, video, which contains kind of fractal animations um, alongside, um, alongside live action footage uh, up the coast of Labrador. So uh, on the left-hand side, that's an origin myth uh, about how the Northern Lights came to be from Nenatsiavut. It's very much linked to uh, Labradorite, which is a mineral, a semi-precious stone found in Labrador. And, uh, and on the right-hand side, there's kind of a Jetsons-inspired, um, optimistic kind of future. Um, and on both sides, there are different uh, star maps, constellations that are um, from uh, Inuit sky lore. Uh, so there are other stories kind of embedded in the stars in the scene. Um, and the, uh, the, the coastline goes from uh, the sea ice, uh, thinking about uh, moving inland with some of the trees, thinking about the Labrador coastline and then finally going into the Torngat Mountains. Um, so yeah, this is probably a, a detailed shot of the origin of the, the Northern Lights. And then these fractal forms that are uh, animated and kind of moving um, alongside um, the drum beat and the music of, uh, or the sound of uh, ocean waves are kind of crashing. These are sort of field recordings that I had done while I was in Newfoundland, Labrador. Um, and a lot of the footage I kind of collected over the past, I guess, 15 years or so, edited into this, this circular uh, projection. Um, oops. Oh no, I can't go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a really brief, uh, a br brief the other side, um, the Jetsons esque. Anyway, I do a lot of mentoring, uh, teach people how to do uh, stop motion animation. I'm here with Pasha Partridge. Her first uh, animation that she worked on went on to garner a few awards. Um, it debuted at uh, Imaginative. And it was a piece that was about her namesake and where her namesake came from. 
and her connection to her Inuit culture. Um, so I love I love teaching people new techniques and really making things accessible. And this is a very do-it-yourself set up, you know, in, a, in an hour or so. And Pasha worked on this piece for a number of days and then uh, learned the animation process, learned how to edit, did the sound recording, wrote the script, did the storyboard, went through the whole process. I'm here with Courtney Montour, who uh, was working with us as one of the mentors. And these are some kids in uh, Sheshashi, which is an Inu village um, in uh, Northern Labrador. And here I'm getting them to, to make uh, phenakistoscopes, which are early um, uh, kind of optical illusion motion machines uh, before the advent of cinema. Uh, so sort of showing them the fundamentals of where animation comes from and then getting them to work on, on characters uh, after that and getting them to work on scripts. So really thinking about uh, community, building capacity, uh, demystifying uh, technology and processes and to make things really accessible and down to earth. So that's it, Nakumek, thank you so much. That's just a brief introduction to, to what I do. Let me stop sharing here. Oh, hello, so good to see people. <laughs> yeah, so um, basically, uh, in terms of, first of all, are, are there any questions? Um, do any folks have any questions they want to ask about, you know, my work or what I do or what we're doing here? <laughs> I'm going to go through um, uh, some of the animation uh, and how to uh, how to put together your, your little bear puppet. Um, I have mine sort of pre-made here. But first, I, I want to um, to go through uh, maybe just a brief uh, history of of stop motion animation in particular, and just highlight some of the people that are doing. Um, or have done interesting things that have uh, that have helped my own like foundational work uh, in animation. So uh, I'm just going to continue talking and go into sharing another PowerPoint presentation if I can find it. Okay, I have to nope, another one. Let me just escape. Is this one it? Okay. I have like two different cameras and all right, this should work. All right. Me there. F5. All right, can everyone see that? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so in thinking about um, uh, animation, I mean, the early optical illusion toys uh, like the thaumatrope, the phenakistoscope, those were the things that I was getting the, uh, the Inu kids to make. Uh, and the zoetropes, those were all, they all worked on uh, sort of the persistence of vision. So the idea that uh, your vision kind of will stay on an image for a while before it's replaced with another one. And so uh, if the images occur uh, quickly enough, there is uh, this kind of illusion of smooth movement that happens from still images in sequence really quickly. So um, the early uh, thaumatropes, I'm sure we've all done this. We've, we've had an image either on a stick or a piece of string. Um, there's a bird on one side, a bird cage on another. That's sort of a famous one. And you twirl them really quickly back and forth and uh, the bird is in the bird cage. And that's what you see. Um, the phenakistoscope works uh, a little bit similarly, although you're looking through slots, you can only see part of the image. And then the image is replaced with the one next to it. 
So uh, although it, it's hard to sort of see in this animation here, if it's moving quickly enough, it looks like the, the horse is running, the horse and the horseback rider and the acrobats moving. Same with the, the zoetrope. Um, I, I have one in the closet. I tried to get it, but I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't find it with the rest of my junk. Um, so these, um, these early optical uh, kind of illusions, around the same time, uh, Edward Mybridge did all of these uh, high-speed um, stop-motion photography uh, to capture movement of uh, animals as well as uh, human beings. So did all these studies in motion, and people have uh, taken his still images and and then just made them into short little animated clips. And you see a lot of these um, on the internet. Actually, uh, you, you can just uh, download a number of them. They're they're quite beautiful, and um, you know this is like God. This is almost 150 years ago. Um, by the same token, um, those sorts of investigations into optical illusions and um, pre-cinema, that sort of thing, uh, flip books became really uh, became really popular and still are popular today as 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 an interesting things. We, we would take our math books and draw little pictures, you know, because our math books are pretty pretty thick and uh, really boring and you know, when you have ADHD and you know you need you need stimulation, you'll you'll draw your little flip books in the corners of your your math book. So all of this just uh, sort of leading up to uh, what became stop motion animation. And I'm really thinking about like early pioneers, like um, um, Oh my God, my brain has gone blank. Um, Voyage to the Moon. Um, it's with him. Anyway, it'll come with me. Come to me at some point. All these early forms of uh, of investigation into to stop what became stop motion animation uh, were really uh, crucial to in, in kind of shaping like early cinema and that that kind of experimentation. So what is stop motion animation? I mean, it's also called stop animation or stop frame animation. It's animation that's captured one frame at a time, sometimes with physical objects that are moved between frames. And when you play back the sequence of images rapidly, it creates the illusion of movement. So you might have seen Gumby. Um, certainly, you know, in Nightmare Before Christmas, these are all different forms of stop motion. Uh, animation. Uh, and I, I'm just going to go through like the various forms. Uh, silhouette animation was one of the earliest forms that really um, that really became uh, popular. Um, uh, Lottie Reiniger uh, is, is an incredible uh, figure and very influential in, in her style of, of animation and the whole process. And she's often credited um, uh, with the adventures of Prince Akma being the first uh, fully animated uh, feature length film. And it's interesting to think that she uh, was doing all these, uh, um, all of these uh, stories and these animations, and I think a few commercials as well, at the same time that Walt Disney was developing his style and uh, his production company and working in, in a very different way, in a, in a more, uh, hand-drawn cell animation uh, kind of way. Uh, Lottie Reiniger actually, uh, I think one of her last films, last couple of films, she worked with the NFB here in Canada. So she came over and uh, she did some color uh, sil silhouette based work um, at the, uh, I, I think at the headquarters uh, here in Montreal, uh, which is where I'm based. I've seen some of her puppets, uh, her real puppets, and they're fantastic. She just made a scraps cardboard. They're backlit in her animation. And um, yeah, really wonderful to see. It's like she was reusing old cereal boxes, whatever she could get her, her hands on. Uh, Norma McLaren uh, became really important um, as a pioneer 
with different forms of animation, in, in particular pixelation. And um, pixelation is basically uh, often using um, the human body and animating a person frame by frame, not in live action, but of taking <laughs> sometimes vast amounts of time between each frame. It, it creates a very surreal uh, kind of staccato look uh, for animating a human being. Um, and you can do wild things like Norm McLaren would get um, uh, in, in Neighbors, for example, he would, he would get the, the men to jump in the air and he would capture the image just as, as their feet were off the ground and in the air. And he would do a series of these. So it looks like they're kind of fluttering around or hovering around off the ground. Oh, why did I go back? Can I go back? I can. There we go. Um, claymation, stop motion, and pixelation. Uh, Jan Smeichmeyer, who's still alive, uh, he's a Czech filmmaker. Um, uh, he's done some fantastic work. And he, he comes from a very surrealist uh, background and is a very distinct use of stop motion technique. Um, a lot of his work is very, uh, it's kind of in the uncanny valley. It can be very creepy and funny, sometimes nightmarish, but he's, he's very much uh, within that realm of surrealist um, uh, kind of play in his work. And of course, uh, claymation, uh, urban, urban animations or urban studios uh, it's probably uh, most well known with uh, Wallace and Gromit and that whole series, also Shaun the Sheep, uh, Chicken Run. Uh, those are both puppet based, and, but primarily a claymation based uh, characters. Um, and yeah, they're wildly popular and um, it's, it's been the basis for uh, other, other animation like uh, Nightmare Before Christmas and Coraline that came later. Uh, puppet animation, I wanted to mention uh, Amanda Strong. Um, she's an Indigenous uh, Michif, uh, filmmaker currently based in uh, Vancouver. And she's the owner, director, and producer of Spotted Fawn Productions, which is an Indigenous-led production company focusing on illustration, stop-motion animation, as well as 2D and 3D virtual reality animation. Um, her work looks into Indigenous lineage, language, and unconventional methods of storytelling. And she works collaboratively um, with, uh, with many, many folks. I love, I love uh, Amanda's, uh, uh, her, her puppets and the attention to detail. And um, I'm really thinking about uh, how characters are developed and conveyed in uh, puppet animation. So by puppet animation too, I mean that they have an internal armature. It's often steel uh, with ball joints. And then there's uh, clothing and latex uh, fitted outside of that. And they're, they're heavily painted. There's often, uh, if a character is in heavy use, there's multiple made, multiples made of that character uh, because the, the puppets uh, do eventually uh, break down. Um, but yeah, like everything is, is kind of made, the old glasses, little outfits, and they're, they're just, they're captivating and adorable. Uh, and object animation, um, this is by Pez, um, also known as uh, Adam uh, Pezbane. Uh, he did um, this famous uh, fresh guacamole um, animation that went viral, I think. Uh, a number of his animations are, uh, are viral videos. They're very short, very well done. And he used a combination of uh, pixelation, uh, pixelation rather, uh, animating the human body and also using day-to-day -day, uh, kind of unexpected objects uh, to make these surreal kind of cooking shows. Very fun. And uh, finally, we have cutout animation. Um, Evelyn Lambert, um, she was kind of uh, uh, instrumental in developing a very particular style of cutout animation. And uh, she worked alongside Norman McLaren for years and years. She's 
uh, one of these women that um, time is sort of forgotten, uh, even though she's completely brilliant. Uh, she's kind of eclipsed for Norma McLaren for many years. Her work is kind of uh, resurfacing now, and there's more work uh, being done around uh, just how much she's contributed to uh, cutout animation in particular. She did a lot of uh, wonderful um, uh, fairy tales um, and sort of uh, children's stories that had uh, moral implications, kind of. Yeah, kind of like storybooks, animated storybooks. Right, so in thinking about uh, that brief history, and it's by, by no means exhaustive, um, I wanted to just throw out there, you know, what tools do we need um, to make stop motion animation? Uh, so I try to keep things very simple. I mean, uh, and very low budget. I mean, do what you can with what the tools that you have. So a camera, a smartphone is really important. Uh, smartphones are great because just about everyone has one and they often have adequate cameras to at least get started. And some of them are quite, the cameras are quite good nowadays. A tripod is great. It's not essential, but it's really, it's really good uh, if you want a steady shot. There are other ways of uh, compensating if uh, for um, a kind of shaky, a shaky camera. Um, there are tools available, or you can just go with a shaky aesthetic if you're doing handheld. I've done that too. It can be quite fun. Lighting is really important because lighting is basically uh, it's lighting your scene. Um, generally speaking, if you're shooting top down, which is what you'll be doing with the bear puppet, uh, it's important to have a um, strong and consistent source of light. Um, today I'm working with daylight, but I do have a fill light that's, uh, that's kind of bounced off the ceiling. A kind of flat, even light is often best for collage-based work or uh, paper, paper cutout stuff. Often if you have a harsh light, um, it's gonna reflect and cause glare. Um, editing software, we're, I'm going to show you Stop Motion Studio and kind of go through that. But basically, if you're familiar with any uh, nonlinear editor, um, you know, it could be Final Cut Pro, it could be um, uh, Premiere. You, as long as uh, you can create a, an image sequence, so as, as long as your camera will take subsequent pictures that are numbered. Uh, which most cameras do by default, uh, you can take a whole series of pictures and then import that whole package into, into your nonlinear editor and it will treat it as, as a movie clip. And then you can set your, um, your frames per second and, um, and go from there. So stop motion studio is not uh, needed, but it's one of the more cheaper options. It's, I think there's a free version and then to buy it outright, it's like $4.99. Um, and then you need puppets, materials, and objects. So uh, the Black Bear paper puppet is a jointed puppet, pretty articulated. Uh, you get a lot of movement out of that guy. And, um, but you can also uh, have, unjointed puppets. So puppets that are just cut out pieces of paper or cardboard um, that aren't jointed. Uh, you can still move them around. It's just, uh, it can be a bit more free form. Um, and certainly with the um, collage base work that I often do, um, my puppets are just pieces of people or animals or things that I bring into a particular scene. So basically to making your own do-it-yourself stop motion video, um, these are some, some I think, uh, six sort of guides. It's like find your setting. So establish where your camera is going to, and then ensure the setting or backdrop fills your frame. So it's a, just about framing your shot and keep the camera focused on what is in frame and uh, not letting um, 
uh, the outer edges encroach on your shot, also not letting your shadow get in the way of what you're doing, uh, unless you want that. Um, fix the lighting. Again, try to keep your uh, filming area away from natural daylight. Natural daylight, even though that's what I'm using here today, it will shift. It will shift radically. It will warm up and cool down. Clouds come. It's, it's hard to find a consistent, um, consistent lighting with daylight, even though I love using it. Um, often I will try and use it for uh, sh very short animation. Um, but having dedicated lights is, is really the way to go. Keep it steady, um, you know, have, um, have a good solid tripod, make sure everything is kind of uh, locked down. Um, yeah, it's important to have like, um, to have a trigger if you can, if you, if you want like a no shaking um, animation, to have a, uh, a trigger to a trigger the, the shutter. So a remote, Hell, if you're hooked up to a computer, it's great because you can either click the mouse, set that to trigger your um, to trigger your frames, so you're not actually touching the, the camera. Uh, figure out your frame rate. This is something that you can play around with uh, in Stop Motion Studio. Um, and one one of the things that I like about it is that you can you can change your frame rate. Um, before you export. So you, you can make it very staccato and choppy or smooth it out. 12 frames per second is the traditional for stop motion animation. Um, although I've used 24, but that's a lot of work. 24 frames per second, so it's 24 pictures you're going to have to take for each second of film time. Uh, but 12 is good. You can, you can go down to eight. Even six is, is fine, uh, depending on what you're doing. Um, and move in small increments. Um, and this is just something you have to get used to. It's, it's about timing and uh, how long a, a movement will take um, to go from A to B. Um, for instance, uh, a figure walking into a frame, you have to think about, well, how long does that take? Is that 1.5 seconds or like, so if you get a sense of timing through doing, I like to just, do hands-on. You can work it out mathematically, but that hurts my brain. And I, I like to just fool around. And finally, editing, um, uploading your images uh, into a dedicated stop motion software app, or if you're using stop motion studio, you're already doing that. It's already built in. And then um, adding sound effects or music, um, and finally exporting uh, that edit. So that's it. Um, that's sort of a, a brief, so many words, you know, these, such a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I get, I get bored with, uh, with reading words um, in presentations. So I'm gonna see if I can switch to, um, see if my software, is it still working? Oh yeah, it is. Um, I was telling Julie early, earlier that I'm using the desktop version of Stop Motion Studio. And, uh, and it occasionally crashes. Okay, I'm gonna try and, um, I'm gonna share my, um, my screen now. You're gonna see my, my top down. <laughs> my top down, yeah, <laughs> wording. Um, my top-down setup, and let me just move things back here a bit. Let's see. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to know, um, did people get a chance to make the puppet? I'll go over it really quickly, and I'll bring that in. Let me just share. There we go. OK. Can everyone see that? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this is my top down kind of. Uh, I have a webcam directly above me. Um, this is the paper puppet that you can download the PDF and print out. Uh, I printed out on heavier cardstock. 
So yeah, you can just uh, cut the pieces out carefully. There's a link um, actually, I don't know if this will focus. Yeah, it won't. <laughs> anyway, if you download the PDF, there's a link to a video that you can watch and I will take you through the interface of Stop Motion Studio. I won't reiterate it here. I'll, I'll go over the basics a little bit. Um, but yeah, once you have your, um, once you have all your pieces cut out, um, you can start putting them together. And um, I use these brads, these uh, fasteners. Let's see if I can get more. And uh, usually they, they come much bigger sizes. I like the small ones because they're a little bit more, a um, little bit more discreet. And um, the joints seem to be a little bit easier to, to move around. So I, I got these on uh, Amazon, I think. Um, yeah, so basically on, uh, on the sheet, there are little dots. And you just pierce, pierce the dots with, um, with like a thumbtack or a push pin uh, just to make a, a pre-hole to make it easier. And um, basically just uh, just tack the joints together. I like to do the legs first and, uh, and then do the arms and then attach, attach the limbs to the body. So it will take a total of nine, uh, nine uh, joints or segments. Uh, so that those are nine, nine of those uh, those uh, brass brads. And um, I like to put the, uh, the legs behind the underwear because putting them on top kind of, uh, it looks a bit weird. But actually I put the, I put the arms in front just because I like, I like the way it looks and the head I also put on top. So that's, that's basically it. Arms and, and, um, and the head on, on front of the body and the legs behind the main body. Pretty easy to put it together. And then you can stretch out his joints a bit if it's a bit stiff. So there you go. You have like your little animated uh, paper puppet bear. And Let's see, should I, should I try making a little scene? Try and actually get down to animation? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I know. So often, um, first of all, uh, paper puppets, they want to, they, they have their own, um, they have their own personality. They want to move a certain way. So I like to do test animations. Um, like getting character to kind of maybe squat or maybe wave, move uh, in and out of frame. So that's a good way to start um, any animation. I mean, before even getting into a storyboard or thinking about a story, it's like, okay, what, what can this character do? And think about uh, maybe uh, entering a frame, doing a little something, and then exiting a frame. That's a good way to, to kind of start and, and think about it. So um, in terms of the interface, uh, the big red button is basically going to cre create a frame. And there you have a frame with my, uh, my arm in it. Um, then you can uh, easily go back and select that and just backspace, backspace and delete delete that frame. Um, huh, wonder if my, I'm going to take another frame. I think my camera, is my camera awake? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fun thing. This uh, webcam sometimes will go to sleep. So, uh, things get frozen. Um, anyway, I'll just roughly go through, uh, the interface. Um, 
uh, right here is uh, just the number of frames. And uh, rewind back, uh, big red button, of course, is to, to take the picture. I think you can also uh, just uh, click on it with your mouse if you don't want your if you don't want your hand in the picture, like this. Um, and uh, the timer is is interesting because uh, you can. This is something you can uh, set up, and it will take a picture, say, every five seconds with a counter, a countdown, 10 seconds, right up to like 90 seconds. If you're, if you're getting really proficient and if you can keep your hands out of the picture before it gets taken, um, and be careful not to have any shadows, you can actually do, do this and automate it. Um, it's a really quick way of, of doing animation. So you're not clicking all the time, uh, but you get into a rhythm. You can like animate and, um, and just keep going. All right. Those are the basic controls over here. This is uh, what's called onion skinning. And this is really important if you're trying to animate. If I want to see the ghost of where, you know, where my bear was, this is really good for getting your timing right and positioning right. So um, you can adjust uh, sort of the opacity of the previous frame, and it helps you. Um, see if I want to move my bear here. Move them sort of the same increment again. Sort of again. Do, do, do. Yeah, so it gives you an idea of uh, of where you've come from, where you're going to, type of situation. Um, onion skinning is something that um, I, I think it's an, a, an old carryover from when the onion skin it wasn't actually onion skin, but it was like tracing paper. It was called onion skin. And um, animators, you had often a lead animator and then um, you had an assistant animator or a tweener, in-betweener uh, that would do the in-betweens of the major um, uh, of the major animation moments. So, so the motion was broken down into big sequences, and then the small little inter intermediate sequences were done by the assistant animator or the in-betweener, and uh, and they often use onion skins to get the, the movement right. So uh, press on the playback, get a sense of that. Now that movement's really staccato and I don't want the first, uh, the first frame so I can just delete it. And um, now I can go into my uh, options here, the little gear. It might be situated a little bit differently um, if you're using um, your smartphone. But you want to go to the speedometer here. And uh, that basically tells you the movie speed or the frames per second. So right now I'm at five frames per second. I'm going to push that up to uh, 10. Oh, let's go animation time, 12 frames per second. Um, and you'll see it'll move much more quickly now and play back. Let's get a sense of that movement. So what, what can we have our guy doing? Let me just turn on the onion skinning again, give you guys. What's it gonna be doing? So, um, in terms of uh, timing with animation, it's just something you have to intuit. Often, when we start thinking about small little movements, often people uh, move move their character way too quickly. Um, 
And then when they get used to the movement, they often move way too slowly. So it's, it's trying to find a, uh, a happy medium, some place in between. And, um, and I find even with myself, like if I've been not animating for a while, I'm rusty. I'm like, my timing's always off. And it's the same for all animators. It takes them a while uh, to get back into a flow or a kind of rhythm. Now, what's neat about um, an articulated puppet is that you notice like I'm pulling on the, like his hand joint, it's moving everything below it. It's kind of like a built-in, what we call inverse kinematics. So uh, moving like the end bone moves the rest of the body. And I'm also holding, holding him down so he doesn't wobble all over the place, but He's gonna wobble anyway. <laughs> so I, I'm just doing a little animation here and seeing what we can do. Do do do. This guy wants to do. And I'll get him to juggle afterwards. Who knows? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, put on some good music. Um, I often will animate uh, to headphones, but I, I I have to choose music that's more kind of soft moving. <laughs> if it's something really boppy, uh, my animation will uh, will totally reflect what I'm listening to. Um, but yeah, it's it's like a meditation. So maybe that's moving a bit much. So we get a sense of, let's well, see what we got. So yeah, you can get a, you can get a feeling for, for the character, how he's moving and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, it's fun to sort of scrub through, um, sort of see how it's playing. So it's, it's good to, it's easy to review on the fly. Like if you want to see, I'm like, oh, maybe I don't like that foot there. You can go back and and uh, take out um, take out a sequence or you can insert your camera. Are you going to let me insert you? Come. <laughs> or insert your camera. Oh yeah, maybe it won't. Well, you should be able to insert your camera um, wherever you need to. And um, let's see if I can take a picture now. No. Anyway, normally you would click this. Uh, you can insert your camera wherever you need to if you need another frame. And uh, you can go back and edit. So the idea is that you can take a uh, number of pictures, but you can go back later and take out a frame and redo it carefully. And you'll be able to see, um, you'll be able to see your ghost, your onion skinning to help you with the new frame. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that's it. What else can I get my, my little guy doing? Uh, also, feel free to like move your camera closer or back. Um, that's one good thing. If you're off tripod, uh, you can zoom in and do like a fake zoom in uh, or out, or pan, move the camera around, really take all kinds of uh, all kinds of action. Let's see, what are we having you do? So yeah, think about a story. Like think about how um, you want your character to move. Um, think about what they, they might be doing. Uh, where, what's my bear doing? I think he might be juggling. He's gonna be juggling. Let's see. Props help. So I'm gonna put, I have this little star thumbtack here. Very dangerous, but. Um, Let's just make him juggle. Let's see here. 
He's catching it there. One, two, three. And we got two now. What's that other one kind of coming out? Um, yes, it's a matter of also remembering <laughs> what's where <laughs> um, when you're animating um, more than one thing. Let's see. Is that right? Did I move that? <laughs> It's so hard to talk and to animate at the same time. It's like, oh, it's like walking, chewing gum. I was never really good at it. <laughs> okay, and put another uh, a little juggle. So I, I'm just um, just get my bear to. I'm sort of moving his arms, but not not real well. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Lordy. The rusty animator. Also, uh, what I like to think about too is sort of uh, backgrounds and um, uh, I mean, right here I have pretty flat blue, but uh, you can really you can really uh, do so much, like in terms of adding all kinds of texture. Um, and it doesn't have to be paper. I mean, it could be cloth, it could be wallpaper, it could be you know magazines, could be all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm just going to go through real quick. Do, do, do. It's like the worst animation ever. Did I move that? <laughs> All right. So this will just give you an idea. Quick and dirty. My hand in that shot. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, even the best of animators, like in the old films, always get a thumb thumb in there or um in one frame. And if uh, if you look hard enough, you, you can see like the animator has like a little thumb there. Um, so are human beings and we rush sometimes. Um, and of course, like for my um, For my collage-based stuff, I want my hands in there, so I, I want that to be part of the process that you see that there's a human being making the piece. So it might be, it might be something that you absolutely want, you know, to show your hands in the animation. If so, um, I would say go ahead and set up your time increment, uh, put it to five seconds or ten seconds, wherever you're happy with, and just uh, go to town. It's it's um, gonna be really fun. So what I'm doing now, I'm sort of finishing the animation, but I don't want it to just stop. And I'm just going to give a tiny little bit of movement to the bear for a few frames. Um, and that's 
that's a way of what we call easing out. So in terms of animation, we'd like to ease into the movement, just um, kind of start it a little bit slowly and then gradually spill, build up the speed and then kind of, and not abruptly in space, but to kind of taper off really softly. Um, also, if your character is just uh, standing still, just take a, a bunch of frames of, of him or your character uh, moving a little bit, just to give it a little bit more life to, um, to your puppet, especially if it's a, a human or animal. We're never, never completely still. We're always a little bit in motion. Okay, let's see what this guy looks like. So there he is, juggling. Oh my God, he actually juggled. <laughs> so there, there you go. I mean, it's sort of an easy thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, if I was to finish this off, I would probably have him just walk away or exit or maybe um, just duck below. Always think about your frame and what it's framing, uh, where your edges are and how your character can move through a scene or what's the important action within that scene. And again, be really aware of uh, your shadows. Even when you're off screen, you can cast a shadow. Um, and if you're animating pretty close uh, next to your set, which I am, don't wear a white t-shirt because you're reflect, you're going to reflect light onto your scene and you'll get really inconsistent, um, you'll get inconsistent background kind of lighting. I've done that so many times. Luckily, I don't have a whole lot of white um, shirts and stuff, but uh, it will reflect. Or if you have a scene that's um, that's uh, very muted tones and you wear like a red top and it's a brightly lit studio, that red's going to reflect onto your scene. So just be careful, careful of that. I tend to wear like dark clothes anyway. So, um, so yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's the bear. Um, have fun uh, and really think about, you know, what your bear can do and, you know, maybe it's, I don't know, Pilates or yoga or something. Who knows, but um, I haven't, I, I only made this little guy uh, yesterday. So, and he's moving differently from the last one that I made. And um, anyway, what's great about these characters is that uh, if you make them, um, you take a picture of them, and reprint them uh, so you know when uh, when when one fails or rips apart or gets buckled up or or used and abused too much you just print out another one and and uh, um, make the same character again um, I have I have more vintage um, vintage characters here oops Sorry, Mr. Bear. Oh, let me just go to the end here. Yeah, let's take a picture of them. So um, these are made with um, with the big style um, uh, brads, these paper fasteners. And uh, you can find these patterns online. Actually, what I'll do, Julie, I'll, 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 I'll find the link online uh, for these uh, traditional characters, because the, the joints are limited, but they're actual vintage paper puppets. And um, although I'm not sure if they were used in animation, they're more like uh, sort of novelty items. But it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of fun to to have like other characters that you can you know animate and think about like a dialogue or um, a scenario where two characters interact, not just one, or maybe there's something in the environment, uh, like I did with the juggling, you know, I mean, the character is kind of interacting with those star-shaped thumbtacks, but they, they read as, you know, juggling <laughs> ninja stars, I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stop sharing so I can see people again. <laughs> back to the, the realm of the uh, 
live action and moving people. Um, are there any questions? I know I've talked a lot and uh, if you have any like specific, uh, oh, I'm, I haven't checked chat. Uh, I think in the chat we just did, oh, okay. So Julie's asking if the, you can, if the desktop version crashes, would you recommend using the app version on a phone or an iPad? Yeah, I would. An iPad would be great. I've, and I've um, I've used this this app uh, on an iPad with with uh, with kids, and it's pretty stable. I feel like the uh, the iPad version or um, uh, the iOS and the Android version um, are more stable for some reason, or maybe maybe it's just my computer. Uh, but it's also me. I, I when I get stressed, <laughs> I, I cause computer crashes and glitches. It's it's my superhuman power that I have. <laughs> I also cause printers to jam. I don't know why, but if I'm really stressed out, I can cause any printer to fail. Um, yeah. So, in terms of animation, there's only so much I can show you. Uh, and I realize it's it's a little bit boring, but um, there's a real joy that comes from taking the time to see how your uh, paper puppet wants to move. Because sometimes the joint seems stiff. It's like you have an idea of how it might move, but the character wants to do its own thing. And um, I, I had I had this one character. It was. Uh, it was pretty complex. It was a silhouette uh, gargoyle. And it had like uh, those kind of um, sort of backward, uh, kind of like an animal front legs, you know, how they, they, they have that bend sort of backwards, like we're as if we're walking on our tippy toes. Um, and I, I, I had so much trouble animating this, this paper silhouette. And then I realized it wants to move a certain way. And there was a spring there was almost like a, a kind of saunter that uh, when I, I did a simple walk cycle, I wasn't expecting at all. I'm like, whoa, this character wants to move this way. So I had to follow that. Like I, I can't have preconceived notions of what I want it to do. But, um, but those are things you find out from playing around with, with your character and what, what it can do and you know where you can go with that. Um, okay, so do you recommend still attempting animation stop motion work even if you are an artist on disability with minimal funds and only have access to outdated slow technology? I'm all about the outdated and slow technology, totally. Um, I think it's doable. Like I've had kids with broken, <laughs> broken phones uh, that were able to still animate and they didn't have a tripod. Uh, I think one guy just ended up duct taping it to the side of a desk or, or no, he put it on a shelf, overhung, <laughs> overhung his uh, smartphone on a shelf and then at, had his little scene on a shelf below and just animated away I say just have fun. I mean, you can make great things with cheap things um, and with uh, outdated technology even. I'm all about that. Like, you know, Halana, one of my main films, uh, I didn't have access to equipment. I think I shot the whole thing in 720p. It's not even HD. It was done just four years ago. I could have updated everything, but I didn't have the means and, um, and I didn't have the time and you know what, it worked. It worked for the piece. So I always say, use what you have. And if you're really passionate about it, um, work, work within those limitations. Um, yeah, so I would, I, would, I would encourage you to just uh, have fun with it. Um, yeah, I've made, some, I've made some great stuff with, um, um, with Stop Motion Studio, just uh, fooling around. And um, what's really fun is just uh, animating objects. Uh, what I used to do is have a whole bunch of clear glasses and uh, move them around, take my frame, take, take my pictures, my hands out 
out of the frame. And so it looks like the glasses are moving around. Then I would slowly fill them up with water. So it looks like the water magically is rising and then pour it out. And it looks like it's magically going down. So th there's lots that you can play around with, not just uh, paper puppets and collage based animation, but with objects that you have um, in your environment. Um, yeah. So, and I, I love working with messy stuff too, uh, not just puppets, but, um, you know, collage, sand. Uh, I work a lot with uh, bones, seal skin, um, glitter, beads, anything that's sort of lying around, you can make it into a picture or a scene. Um, so yeah, I, I would just, just say, um, yeah, stay open to the process and just keep exploring. Uh, that's what it's about. And, you know, ultimately I can teach sort of the fundamentals, but the real animation is just what you do. It's the unexpected and it's the playing around. And it's only through the playing around and making mistakes and trying different things that you get good. And you know, yeah, I put in my 10,000 plus hours of animation, but really it often will take me a few days. Once, I, if I was to start an animation project now, it would take me a few days before I really start to get into a flow where I know how things are moving. I know the timing and it becomes sort of embodied and intuitive. Um, so this is usually the point where <laughs> I say, go, go make a mess, uh, go out there, experiment, don't be afraid, demystify the whole process and, and just animate with things and objects around you and junk and, and unexpected stuff. You know, when, when Pasha, uh, when she was working on her first animation, um, she decided, because she had this big, piece of seal skin. She's like, I'm going to do my animation on seal skin. I'm like, oh my God, that's so difficult to light and so beautiful. And I'm so glad she did it. And she's like, yeah, I'm going to just pour these beads over here and see what happens. I'm like, that's it. And it became this beautiful background for this whole process that she found so much joy and ultimately play in. I think as adults, we don't, we don't play enough. And uh, it can be really therapeutic, but also you can make really beautiful things. Glenn, so one of the questions is, do you have any tips with using lighting indoors so that you don't get shadows? Yeah, okay. So a big thing uh, with lighting, um, uh, if, you're, if you're lighting uh, something that's very flat, like a shooting top down, which is what I often shoot with, have your lights coming in at 45 degree angle. So have two, it would be great if you have two that are exact same uh, color temperature, exact same brightness, and you're shooting so that they, they, hit your, um, they hit your scene at a 45 degree angle. Generally, that's, that's uh, the best. I mean, there's more complicated stuff where you can polarize your lights and then have a circular polarizer on the lens of your camera if you're working with DSLR, which will cut out all the reflections. But that sort of, maybe that's advanced. <laughs> but I would say, try to have flat, consistent lighting. And what I usually do um, is, because uh, we have white ceilings, I'll, I'll bounce the light off the ceiling and that's usually enough to spread the light out evenly and to do away with any harsh shadows. Uh, so soft, even lighting is, is usually the best uh, for top-down collage-based animation. If you're lighting a set, of course, and you're doing uh, 3D stuff and you're working with puppets, it's different. You light for the puppets, you light for the scene. But uh, yeah, for flat stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'm just reading. Oh, thank you for all the great advice. And, and oh, thank you. Uh, would it be possible to share any of the artist links from? Oh yes, I will. I will put that PowerPoint together as a PDF, um, and uh, the links should be should be all embedded there, so you can actually see the works in motion. 
I didn't have a chance and I didn't want to risk my computer getting mad at me or quitting <laughs> to follow those, those links online. Plus you get those annoying ads. So who knows what's going to pop up. God. Um, yeah, but definitely I'll share that with you. Um, Thank you. And, and I love the bear. I think he's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you. It's so much fun to for me to share. I do have I, I, I can do another quick demo if we have time. If, but if other people have questions, I can totally answer. I don't do know a what, quick demo. But can I, I ask just one, one last thing? Sorry. I don't know whether on this one it has the link to the um, stop motion one. You said when you were showing yours, it looked like it had something written for a link of uh, how to use stop motion. And I wondered. Can't see it on that one. You can also put a bunch of that stuff on the website, Claire. Um, yeah. We'll put some, we'll, what we'll do, Glenn, is under your profile of artist, we can put some of those links so yeah. that you have access to it. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because the the link to the the PDF bear puppet also has a video that's embedded that goes through the interface again. So if you didn't catch it with with the demo that I kind of screamed through this time. You can go back and watch it, and I uh, and that one's more focused on the um, uh, the smartphone app. So uh, it's a better representation of what what you actually will engage with, uh, and I probably go through things a bit more thoroughly. Uh, so de definitely, that's that's out there as a reference. Uh, I can provide that link as well, in addition to the PowerPoint. The link is also I was just going to show that. There was a couple questions here. So Kristen says, hi, Kristen. I love your film, Kanyak. It was my favorite film from Imaginative last year. How did you create the background with the beadwork? And then Cease also has a question, which I can easily answer. So you want the download. Um, Marika put it in the earlier part of the chat. Marika, can you pop that back into the chat? Because she might not have seen it if she's come later. Hi, Cease. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Somehow I was never sent a link and I, I spent a whole half hour just trying to, I, I thought I'd set it all up and I thought I could just jump in and then it didn't, I wasn't able to find a link. So thanks for sending me the link so I could even get into this, but I'll be looking for the links. I can see the first part that I missed and uh, it's a really great workshop. Thank you, Glenn. Um, oh, you're quite welcome. So yeah, uh, <laughs> and the link you can download, you can download this uh -huh. the Black Bear uh, paper puppet, print it out and get some fasteners at the dollar store and put it together and then animate the guy. Great. Cool. Yeah, I'm just gonna do a little piece with some felted materials and uh, I've been making scenes. And so I just was like, oh, this workshop came along right when I was wanting to figure out how to do some of the details. Um, and I, I have downloaded a stop motion uh, camera app. So I'll mess around with that. So it really helped seeing this and very clear step-by-step -step instructions. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Yeah, there, there are there are a number of um, stop motion apps out there. I mean, I, I focus on stop motion studio, but there's also, uh, uh, I think, Clip Studio. There's a, yeah, I mean, you can basically use use anything. I've I've even animated stuff, just my camera, just taking pictures uh, and making sure I just take a whole bunch and not um, not interrupt them with other things. Uh, but then download that th all those images into uh, Premiere and um, import them as an image clip. And then that becomes my animation. And you can play around with, uh, with the timing of that and slow it down or speed it up. Uh, and that's really fun too. And that's a really quick and dirty way of, of working. Um, um, but yeah, mostly it's just, to... just have fun. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the background with the beadwork? 
Oh yeah, sorry, the the B word. Oh, it's okay, God. that's my job. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the ADHD is kicking in. <laughs> Papa needs his meds. Oh God. Um, yeah. So the um, the beadwork. Oh, it was actually uh, my pop socket here on my phone that I took picture of, and there was. Uh, a special plugin that I found, an obscure antiquated plugin uh, that I found for After Effects, and it created uh, kaleidoscopes. Uh, there are a number of different kaleidoscope uh, plugins. This particular one I loved, and I remembered it from years past, and it was free. And so I used that plugin to create other Mandela type of uh, designs. And uh, my pop socket, you know, as you, you can see, I mean, it's blue. It's uh, and so I just colored, colored those those beads, different colors, um, and just animated them uh, using After Effects. So, yeah, that's great. I use, Thank After, you. I use After Effects quite a bit. Yeah. Thanks so much. This is an incredible workshop. I'm really excited for and thankful for this opportunity. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're able to, to come. There's so much more I want to teach you, but, <laughs> but it's hard through Zoom. And it's it's with, you know, because most of my practice is so materials based that um, there's a real joy that comes from, again, experimentation and animating with the unexpected, I think. Awesome. So do you think, you, um, how do you want to leave it, Glenn? Do you want to do one last thing or you kind of feel like you're ready to? No, let's, let's, you want to do, let's do something more like completely experimental. And... Yeah. I was like, let's just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me just, let me see if I can share my screen. Am I still here? I'm going to just continue with uh, <laughs> the ghosts of Christmas past. Um, let me just take a frame here. All right, everyone see that? Yeah? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I've got this, this bear. I'm going to line him up. But this is a technique I, I love. I love to do. And um, this is sand, by the way. I love sand. So I'm just gonna cover cover this sandbox. Let me shake. There you go. And. Um, Let's see. Seashells in there. Yeah, I think that's good. All right. You know what? I'm going to put this one on a timer. See what happens. See if I can keep my my hands out of the picture. <laughs> All right, should we go? All right. Oh, my hand is probably in it. So I'm doing this sort of blind. And yeah, I love working with sand and reveal having pictures sort of reveal. So this will what this is what this will be. 
Try and keep your hands at the picture. You know, I love the little like you're uh, when you're doing the thing, it makes it feel like you're actually here. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um, now this this scene I would probably I would probably light in an interesting way. I would probably add more dramatic light in addition to uh, let's just keep that guy crap. Okay. Oh, it's his eye. I thought it might be his nose. <laughs> so this is sort of a nice, uh, a nice way to reveal an image. Um, the organic way and sort of play around. I love portals and holes and transitions into other spaces or like the idea that there are worlds behind other through other other worlds. Oh god, it's like mad dash. Like I'm digging in the dirt. <laughs> oh Lord. So I, I like this sort of framing. So but I'm just gonna continue to move move the sand a bit. Again, you don't want to end abruptly. You'd like to have a little bit of a softer ending. Um, a little bit of movement. Alrighty. There you go, Mr. Bear. Yeah. Today's episode brought to you by Bear and the letter B. Alrighty. Okay. Now, let's play that back. Well, I'm gonna play the whole thing back because I can't. <laughs> this is a conversation with bears. So you can see how that that is like a whole other kind of very quick and, and easy transition to do, but it gives you a, a totally different feeling for um, for what you can animate with, like just using objects. A very fun little transition. Oh, look, we're right at four. 
So yeah, play with sand. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, folks. Um, yeah, it was it was super fun to to do this workshop. I hope you learned something. Uh, again, it's it's a bit surreal for me uh, because I'm I'm so used to giving these uh, in person and playing around. But I, I hope uh, I hope it inspired you to to uh, do some animation and to use the tools and, like I said, just experiment and have fun. Is Julie gone? <laughs> well, I, I guess I should, uh, I'll, I'll wait around. But if anybody has any questions, um, oh, she says, just running to the bathroom. We'll be right back. <laughs> Glenn, I have a question. Sure. I don't know if anybody asked. Well, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun and you covered a lot. So I'm looking forward to the second one. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody asked it before, but you know the notes with the steps, the preparation steps? Yeah. Do you have that anywhere that uh, you- Yeah, I'll, I'll post that. Um, I'll export it from the PowerPoint. I'll just make a PDF, but all the links will be there too. I'll make it available to everyone who, um, who is at this workshop. I guess if you could send uh, Julie your uh, email address. Um, oh, I'll just quickly interrupt here and say that I have everyone's emails and I can send out through Eventbrite okay. documents and oh. also, we'll also post things on the on the website. Perfect. So. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, but definitely all the notes and stuff will be available as well as the link to the the paper puppet and um, and the the video that you can. Uh, watch and, and just have a refresher. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. It was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I feel like I, I just kind of zoomed through a lot of stuff, but, you know, if anything, it's, it's, uh, it's just about, yeah, trying it out yourself and uh, seeing what works, what doesn't. Um, I have one kid in my class, I had mentioned the app that he might want to download. And that evening he went home, he got his dad's uh, smartphone, downloaded the app, and spent the entire evening just animating. And when he came back the next morning, he, had, he knew all these concepts of like proper timing, how to set up his frame. Uh, it was amazing. It's like, no, 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 I want the lighting this way. No, 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 I think this is good. I'm like, how do you know so much? He's like, oh, I did it last night. <laughs> I just went through the tutorial and uh, yeah, so cool, sir. <laughs> but I love to see that, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I realized I had lined up a bunch of clips um, <laughs> for my own animation to show and I, I forgot to, to show them, but that's okay. You can see my stuff. Um, um, most of my animation on uh, Vimeo, and I'll 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 leave that link um, with Julie as well. Yeah. Awesome. Sorry, guys. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Oh, hey, Julie, you're back. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I sent you a message. I was like, there's yeah, a little, there's <laughs> a situation here, so I was like, I'll be right back. But I I was worried that you wouldn't have heard me, horse read the message, so. Sorry about that. I do want to say thank you so much for joining us. As always, it's a pleasure to hear your voice. It was nice to see all those familiar faces on there too. Lots of people that we know and some new, some new folks. And so it was exciting to launch. It'd be so much better if we were in the lab, but I was like, this is what it is for now. Yeah. So yeah. we're really happy to host you. Well, it was, it was really fun. Nakumek, everyone. I was, uh, <laughs> I hope you got something out of it. Yeah, we totally did. It was great. All right. And um, just a quick little follow up. Glenn's going to do another workshop, but it will be more of an intermediate workshop for people with a little bit of experience on animation. And yeah. so that will be April 21st at 1.30. So yeah. we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.